This is Robert A. Peterson in his teaching on Johannine theology. This is session number eight, Jesus' Signs, part two, Jesus' Time Sayings, part one. We continue our study of the theology of the Gospel of John, or Joannine theology. We're studying Jesus' signs, his revelatory miracles in the fourth gospel. We're up to the second sign, healing of the official son, in chapter 4. <clears throat> this occurs after the episode of Jesus and the Samaritan woman and the Samaritan people. And so he again came to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you, it's plural, see signs and wonders, you will not believe, unless you people. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go. Your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And when they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. I said that five of the seven I am saying speak of Jesus as the life giver. Most of the signs do the same. And this is one of those. Jesus gives life to the son who is near death. Physical life. He, was, he is the life giver. He also gives eternal life to the family who believes. The, uh, the faith of the official is in contrast to the general malaise, spiritual malaise of the Galileans concerning whom Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. This man believed Jesus' word and headed for home. He didn't say, oh, no, no, please, you've got to come. He believed in long distance healing. He trusted Jesus and his trust was well placed indeed. Healing the official son is uh, remarkable. Actually, uh, 98 times John speaks of faith, but it's more complicated than that, as you might imagine. The Gospel of John is a, a river which a child can wade and an ele elephant can swim. If we study all those occurrences of faith, we find the doctrine of inadequate faith. We find it, first of all, in chapter 2. Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs he was doing, that looks good. That fits the purpose statement in 20, 30, and 31. These signs are written that you might believe. And this is the way we, we discern inadequate faith in the Gospel of John. Of course, from the very near context. They believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. John 2, 24. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in a man. I won't do this now, but the very next words say, now there was a man, speaking of Nicodemus. We won't go there now, but there's a bridge right there. Uh... This is inadequate faith. 
Apparently, it's just faith in Jesus as a miracle worker. Surely, if somebody really believes in Jesus, Jesus would commit himself to them, entrust himself to them. So this is inadequate faith. Astonishingly, in Samaria, Jesus finds lots of faith. That is very unexpected. Uh, John does not reproduce the parable of the Good Samaritan, but he shows the Samaritan woman. He portrays her as a female evangelist, if you will, leading the city to the Lord. Now, and the Samaritans are great believers. Look at this. Uh, John 4, 41. And many more. So, so you have inadequate faith in 2, 23, 24. You have actually uh, Nicodemus not believing, not even understanding in chapter 3. You have the Samaritan woman believing, and not only so, verse 41, Jesus stays with them a couple days, 441, many more believe because of Jesus' word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Then we read these words. After this, after the two days, he departed for Galilee. A parenthetical comment, an, an explanatory comment. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Uh, that is not an encouraging word. That is indicating that the very next words that follow do not show a genuine and full belief, an adequate belief. So when he came to Galilee, they welcomed him. I would be good by itself. I wouldn't think it was a bad thing, except for the words before it. And these words are, can create a question too. Having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone there. That harkens back to 2, 23, 24, where we have the first mention of inadequate faith. Then Jesus comes to Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water to wine. And that's when he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you won't believe. And in spite of that, <coughs> the official shows great faith, believing Jesus can heal at a distance simply by speaking his word. So we're not surprised to find a summons to faith in Christ all over the fourth gospel, very plain, as if Jesus were speaking right to me, he is. But we also have this doctrine, and we'll see it in other places. It's in chapter 8, which, which perplexes commentators. Commentators oppose the straightforward thing John says because it's so unlikely in their minds that these Jews, whom it says believe in him, uh, claim to be, he says they're slaves of sin. Must be a different group. Uh, I don't think so. I do not think so. Uh, and then in chapter 12, we'll see it in different places in John's gospel. Jesus heals a lame man in chapter 5. There was a pool, the sheep pool was near the sheep gate, a pool. Lots of invalids there, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man had been an invalid, we don't know if he was born this way, but for 38 years. Jesus said, do you want to be healed? The man said, yes, sir, yes. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. There was a myth that went, at least I think it's a myth, that uh, an angel would visit the pool and if you jumped in there right away, you could be healed. But while I'm trying to get there and be the first one, somebody else beats me to it. There's a textual variant which does not belong, which talks about the angel. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And he did. <laughs> At once the man was healed, took up his bed and walked. And the Pharisees and leaders said, praise the Lord. This is, a one, this is the kingdom of God coming. As Isaiah, no, they, they, they didn't. They said, 
He did this on Saturday? You know the law says, thou shalt not heal lame men on Saturday. My gosh. Oh, this is, John doesn't quote it, but he shows again and again. This is, they strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. They focus on the picayune stuff. The guy carried his mat. For Pete's sakes, he had been miraculously healed. Wouldn't you climb your, carry your mat? Oh my goodness. And they're swallowing the camel. They're, they're stumbling over what should give them great cause of thanksgiving. God has shown his glory. God has been merciful to a son of Abraham. Uh, so I wonder how Jesus could endure this stuff. You can't carry your bed on Saturday. The man said, he sounds like the little guy. I, I don't know, really know that he was little, but I see him as a little feisty guy in chapter 9. Perhaps it's uh, sanctified imagination. At least I hope it's sanctified. Here, this guy says, sounds like the blind man to me. The man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And if he said, walk 10 miles with a post stake behind your left ear, I'm on it. <laughs> Whatever he says, I'm going to do it. Oh, my word. Once again, the lame, in this case, healed, has better spiritual instincts than the fathers and brothers of Israel. Who is the man who asked you to break the Sabbath? He didn't know who Jesus was. For Jesus didn't stay around, hang around to get the credit. Jesus finds him in the temple and says, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Does that necessitate the conclusion that his uh, infirmity was the result of his direct... No, but could he uh, become a, an alcoholic and ruin his liver? Sure. Or maybe some think he's speaking of spiritual danger as well. The man went away, told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. I don't think he gets high marks for gratitude for doing that. Anyway, they were persecuting Jesus because of that. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Uh, but Jesus said to them, he is not one to back down from a fight when it is important. If he just looked the other way all the time, they would have died in their sins. He at least awakened some from their spiritual stupor by confronting, by challenging them. That's why he heals on Saturday. Acts 6, many even of the priests, the Levites, believed in him. If Jesus had played nice, if he had played softball, I don't know if that would have happened. God used his son to confront the authorities for the sake of the people, first of all, to, to separate them from these leaders that they might believe. The synoptics say Jesus was, was moved within. He was sad because the people were like sheep without a shepherd. My father is working till now and I am working. Once again, I see Jesus healing the lame man to be part of his life giving. He gave life, he gave vigor, he gave strength and healing to a man whose legs had been inoperative for 38 years and he immediately gets up and gets going. And yes, he picked up his mat. Ugh. They're seeking all the more to kill him, John 5, 18, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath in this terrible, flagrant manner, ugh. I'm being facetious. But he was even calling God his own father, wouldn't they? Of course they would. Oh, but not in this way. He was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. I'm not going to get into the beautiful sermon that follows, but I will speak to this matter. Of course they would say God is their father. Oh, Jesus revealed the fatherhood of God in his own relationship to the Father, and then inviting believers into that relationship under him with the Father. 
But it was an Old Testament truth. But Jesus claimed that his healing was the work of his father. And they understood that was Jesus' way of talking about God. My father is working until now, and I am working. The Talmud is a later writing, but we think many of the ideas go back to the time of Jesus. The writing is later, there's no question. And it is a mixture of wisdom and ridiculousness and picayuneness and a great mixture. Rabbis commenting on rabbis, and, and, but some real wisdom. Anyway, the Jews, is it proper to say the Shema when you're in a tree? Rabbi Eliezer says, yes, because God made the heavens and the earth. And Rabbi Yaakov says, no, because uh, you, you stand on your feet on the ground and raise your hand. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, here was the real problem. As the Jews thought about it, and deeply, God rested on the seventh day. Does God work on Saturday? This was a serious problem addressed in the Talmud. And as the Jews thought about it long and hard, they said, God does at least three things on the Sabbath. He brings babies into the world. Birth happens seven days a week. They were not prepared to say birth on Saturday had a different cause. Furthermore, elderly Jews died seven days a week. Once again, the Lord took them. And God, the creator, is also the God of providence. And God keeps the world going seven days a week. We think it is something like this background that is behind verse 16. My father is working until now. There are certain works that God does seven days a week. And I am working I work the works of God, and I take the place of God. doesn't say it in John, but it, we cannot help but think of the synoptic saying, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. She said, an outrageous thing to say, unless you're God, a divine being. They get it, and they are very unhappy, and they would stone him to death. They want to kill him. They're seeking all the more to kill him. Not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father in such a way as to make himself equal with God. Well, at least he's clear. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat the feeding of the 5,000. When I dealt with the I am saying I'm the bread of life, I discussed that. I will simply say the meaning of this sign is once again to show Jesus is the giver of life. The manna sustained the fathers in the wilderness. Jesus' multiplication of the loaves, and especially the loaves, but also the fish, extended the enlivened the people, sustained the people. And more importantly, it is drinking his blood, blood and eating his body that brings eternal life. He's the life giver. Jesus rescues the disciples at sea, 6, 16 to 21. When evening came, John 6, 16. I see this as a, another place. I see this as overlapping with the I am the gate of the sheep. Jesus is the way into the people of God on earth. And I am the way, the road to the Father's heavenly house. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those two I am sayings show he's Savior. This sign also shows the same. When evening came, John 6, 16, his disciples were de went down to the sea, got into a boat, started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Remember, these are sailors, at least four of these guys. 
When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the water, coming near the boat. And just like we would be, they were frightened. Are you kidding me? It's even worse. They're sailors. They never saw something like that. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Uh, there's debate. But it looks to me like it's a sign. And uh, Jesus is shown to be the Savior. He rescues them from the storm. Uh, that much is plain. And was it, there a, a motorboat type operation going on? It looks like something like that. Uh, some say, uh, and the, uh, the fog lifted and they saw they were close to shore. Maybe. Uh, I want to be more like Doug Moo and his uh, a theology of Paul and his letters. He actually says, maybe, probably too much for me. But talk about fairness. Oh, I love the guy. Oh, there are three views here. And uh, oh, this one, I, I really disagree with this one. But these two, it's really hard to decide. But I slightly favor the third one because of, well, that's great scholarship. I mean, by the way, that won't preach. <laughs> In my seminary days, we had a great scholar. And he was always giving you five views. And these three are possible. We had the preachers on the faculty. They were sometimes too dogmatic because preachers just can't say, oh, there's three views. You've got to preach something. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jesus saves them from the storm and maybe <laughs> caused the boat to immediately get to the other side. Uh, there is a difference of opinion. And I'll pull a Doug Moo and say, I respect those who agree with me and those who don't rescues the disciples at sea. I do see a rescue. I do see a sign. Heals the man born blind. We've done this one already. And I'm not going to repeat. I'll simply say this goes with the I am saying. I'm the light of the world and shows Jesus as the revealer. He raises Lazarus. I'm not going to repeat that one. That shows Jesus as the life giver. I'm the resurrection and the life, and he proves it by raising his friend from the dead. I'm not going to repeat that one. The miraculous catch of fish. In chapter 21 is cool. <laughs> I bet you never heard that before. It's a cool passage. 21 of John. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Lots of disciples were there. Peter says, I'm going fishing. They're going with him. They got out and got in the boat and all, all night and fished and found Zippo. No fish. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He said to them, children. Now that kind of perplexes me. Would somebody else call them children? Would that be a customary way of an older person talking to them? I don't know. I thought maybe that would have given them a little tip off right there. But children, do you have any fish? No. Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. I don't know. I guess there's different kinds of fishermen in the world. But I can see some crusty old sailor saying, hey, heck with you. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I fished all night and got nothing. But they immediately obey. Blows my mind. Luke 5. Doesn't Peter hesitate there? Don't they hesitate? I think they do. The result is the same. And that's why John knows who it is. Yeah, Peter, Luke 5. Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Peter's not nasty. But he says, Master, we toiled all night and caught nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. Boom! They're breaking the nets. 
the timing at least is miraculous. So they cast a note, the net, the note, the net on the right side of the boat. I'm conflating these words. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. <laughs> well, yeah, it makes sense. They, re they remember what happened in Luke 5. Peter wants a private audience. He has his underclothes on. He puts his over. He goes in to see Jesus, and it's man, mano a mano. Jesus takes him through three steps of tough repentance. I take it to mean to rectify the three denials. Jesus and Peter alone. The other disciples, John 21, 8, came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. Jesus is cooking a little meal there, his little charcoal fire going, bring some of the fish. Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. He's a strong man, full of large fish, 153 of them. St. Augustine and other fathers interpreted that symbolically. Uh, John counts, but I don't think this is symbolic of the, I forget, the world or whatever kind of deal they do with that. And although there were so many, <laughs> the net was not torn. It sounds like it's unusual, but I'm not trying to multiply signs needlessly. Come and have breakfast. Again, this is not my private interpretation, but... Uh, in Luke 5, Jesus uses it as an occasion to teach, I will make you fishers of men. Customarily for John, he refers to a synoptic teaching, or in this case, even a synoptic event. Am I saying this is the, this is the same catch? No, no. It is similar to two different great halls of fish, okay? But they're to remember that one, and they are to remember the words, I will make you fishers of men. Hence, this sign also shows Jesus is the Savior because he, through them, will save human beings. Hence, seven signs plus Jesus' resurrection plus the eighth sign, miraculous catch of fish. And let me label them. Water to wine is savior. Jesus replaces the Jewish purification rites with the new wine of the kingdom of God. Heals official son, life giver. Heals lame man, the same. Feeds the 5,000, same. Rescues the disciples at sea, savior. Heals man born blind, revealer. Raises Lazarus, life giver. Raises himself, life giver. Miraculous catch of fish, savior. Let me use John 14, 6 then, not only for the seven I am's, but John 14, 6, I am the way, no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the savior. Water into wine seems to show that. Rescuing the disciples at sea seems to show that. Miraculous catch of fish is designed to make them, to show them, to encourage them to be fishers of men. Three times Savior. I'm the truth. Only one of the signs seems to me to be teaching that Jesus is the revealer. All the rest show he is life giver. That is the major accent of the fourth gospel as far as Christology goes. Oh, he's the revealer of God. No one has ever revealed God like he did. My goodness. But the major part of that revelation is he is the one who gives eternal life. Oh, yes, he's the Savior. And John has atonement motifs. Maybe not the ones you were expecting. <laughs> I have learned not to expect. Oh, I'm so surprised to find that in the Bible. I'm not. I don't expect to find stuff in the Bible. 
I find what's in the Bible. I try to find what's in the Bible. I know I don't do it perfectly, but I try to find what is there. Time sayings. I've got five different categories. The time of Jesus' public manifestation. I mentioned that before. The time of the Father's protection of the Son. Twice at least. Times present and future. Already and not yet. Time of Jesus glorification specifically. And in John speak, that means he's being lifted up on the cross. He's being raised and is returning to the Father. The cross is included in his glorification. The time of the disciples' persecution, very importantly, in the book of glory, that is brought in to the picture. Jesus' time sayings, I'd like to at least begin these. We saw in chapter 2, they had run out of wine at a wedding. Jesus takes the place of the bridegroom and provides wine. Oh my, does he. Big jars full of it by turning water into wine. Uh, he does the work of the, he who was the father's agent in creation, does the work of recreation here, if you will. My time has not yet come, mother. I take it to be the time of my triumphal entry, my public and grand disclosure, in which he rides into Jerusalem as a king on a donkey. And the children yell, Hosanna. And the leaders say, tell them to stop it. Jesus says, if they don't do it, the stones will cry out. He's not hiding it anymore. He's not saying, now look, go and tell the, give the, uh, the man to somebody he healed. Go make the proper sacrifice of the priest and don't spread it around. Half the time they spread it around anyway. But he's not trying to make the public splash. He does change water to wine doesn't seem to draw a lot of attention to himself. Doesn't want to. Chapter 7, we never actually read it. Ah! His own brothers didn't believe in him. Ah! No wonder he appeals to, appears to James after his resurrection. Ah, but that was beautiful. I bet James had tears of repentance, of remorse. After this, John 7, 1, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Yes, he is God, and he is sovereign. He gives eternal life to whomever he wants, chapter 5. At his voice, the dead will be raised, chapter 5, 28, 29. He's God. I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. And our ability to keep the sheep saved, over and over and over, he's God. My Father's working until now, and I'm working, John 5. Puts his healing of the lame man on a par with the providential working of God every day. Keeping the universe going. But he's also responsible. Can we perfectly put these things together? No, no more than we can fit. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility perfectly together in any case. But they're both true. So we better, have them, we better acknowledge them both and put them together the best that we can. Feast of booze or tabernacles was at hand. His brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. I'm not reading it right because it's sarcastic. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known, known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. It was with dripping sarcasm. John's explanatory comment, editorial comment, for not even his brothers believed in him. Go and show off your magic trips, ma magician tricks, magician. You want to be a public figure, a great man. Go and do it. Ah, how that must have been hard to take. His own family didn't even believe in him. Oh, Mary did. I don't know when Joseph died, but he didn't. He surely wasn't around when Jesus died. Jesus wouldn't have needed to commit him to John, the apostle, John, son of Zebedee. Ah! 
Jesus said, my time has not yet come. There's the time saying. Oh, here comes a, a zinger. But your time is always here. He even loves his brothers by pointing out their sins. My guess is at the time, they would have a different interpretation of this action. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. In other words, brothers, you belong to the world. <laughs> you go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. I guess I'm glad the ESV hasn't put, stuck the word in there now, but that's the meaning, obviously, from the context. I'm not going up to this feast now because after his brothers had gone up to the feast and he also went up, not publicly, but in private. That's where I get this interpretation. And it is an interpretation. Neither two nor seven of John say it. But my understanding is those two time sayings, two, four, seven, six, and eight, speak of Jesus following the Father's timetable and not wanting to make a public splash uh, to use the what eventually happened. He did not want the triumphal entry to happen too soon because he didn't want to be crucified too soon. He had three and a half years of public ministry, preaching, teaching, healing the sick, casting out demons, although John doesn't record that. The Jews were looking for him at the feast. Oh, you bet they were. They're trying to accuse him of something. Where is he? Much muttering about him among the people. And guess what their responses were? Some said, he's a good man. Positive response. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Negative response. How much do we find that? My goodness. Over and over again. Ever since the prologue, chapter 1, 10 through 13. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one openly spoke about him. Blind man's father's parents were cowed. The Jews had power over the people. Again, I'll say it. That's one of the reasons Jesus healed on Saturday. That's one of the reasons we have Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. <laughs> Jesus had to break their whole stranglehold on the people who were like sheep without a shepherd. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up and began teaching. The Jews marveled, saying, How is it this man has, has learning when he has never studied? He wasn't a disciple of anybody. He's got disciples. He has no rabbi. Oh, he's got a rabbi. He says, My father is my rabbi. <laughs> Teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. The Father's my teacher. And I love this. This is a wonderful open verse that is as valid today as it was in Jesus' day. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. We should use that verse with people today. Oh, I don't know. Have, re, have somebody read it, explain it to them and say, if you will have an open mind in reading the Gospel of John, I would pray and watch God work in your life. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Ooh. He's getting serious, Dutch, now. Why do you seek to kill me? Crowd said, he have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? And Jesus goes on and beats them at their own game. I did one work. You all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. You, you, you cut a little bit of flesh off on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, a minor surgery, if you will, a minor physical manipulation... If it's the eighth day of a baby's life, he's circumcised on the Sabbath. They're working on the Sabbath. Oh, no. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, 
so that the law of Moses may not be broken. Are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well, not just as removed his foreskin? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. In other words, obey the law with the spirit of the law and not just the letter. For Pete's sakes, don't enforce the letter of the law to refuse your Messiah. And the people again are perplexed. I'm from the Father, he says. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. They were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. You know why? Because his hour had not yet come. 7.30, along with 8.20, show the Father's protection of the Son. Oh, the Son avoids Judea, 7.1 of John, because they're gonna, they want to get him, and he's not going to tempt the Father. Oh, but when it's the Father's will, he's there, and he's trusting, and no one lays a hand on him, because his time, his appointed time to die, rise, and return, which 13.1 actually defines for us in those terms, has not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. Yet because of his own <sighs> messages that perplex them. Yet because the leaders oppose him. Yet because their own friends say, yeah, but this doesn't make sense and that doesn't make sense and that doesn't square with what we know about the Messiah. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? No, he won't. That's when the Pharisees send people to arrest him and they come back empty handed. <laughs> because never has a man spoke the way this man has spoken. Uh, we will take it up again in our next lecture, seeing another occasion when they wanted to stone him, but they were not successful. They did not even in get do it because God restrained them. His time had not yet come. This is Robert A. Peterson in his teaching on Johannine theology. This is session number eight, Jesus' Signs, part two, Jesus' Time Sayings, part one. Thank you.